Van Tassel probably didn't have a good conception of what high voltage and, and uh, combustible materials can do. So perhaps that was one of the intuitive ways that prevented him from finishing it. But the acoustic chamber is amazing. You sit, if, you, if you sit right in the center where that uh, cylinder, the pole, um, the pillar was, it, it basically um, rebounds all the sound from your voice back to you. So it feels like it's an unusual feeling to, to hear no echo at all except for yourself. Um, so it, it's a fantastic, interesting um, energy chamber. And from that, I found that reading about Van Tassel um, caused me to relate to uh, George Lakofsky's work, Townsend Brown, Nikola Tesla, and of course the ETs who basically were inspiring him um, w along with the Tesla coil uh, concept. And he basically designed it as a rejuvenation chamber. Back years ago when I read this, I didn't think there was anything that could be really uh, understandable from that. But as I got more interested in the 1980s, for example, I developed Gauss meters for measuring power line magnetic fields. I had to be um, aware of bioelectromagnetics because it became an interesting topic. And also, uh, for my business, I started to feel this is a community that needs this um, type of measuring uh, techniques. For example, anyone watch the UFO Hunters on television? That's a pretty good show. Recently, they were talking about geomagnetic anomalies. And unfortunately, uh, the scientist that's on the show walked around with a handheld Gauss meter. That's totally wrong when you want to measure Earth magnetic fields. The Earth magnetic field in northern hemispheres is almost vertical. So we designed a geomagnetometer that you hold vertically uh, by your hand. And the, the company is called Integrity Design and Research that bought my business and now still sells these instruments today. The geomagnetometer is great. You can walk back and forth, back and forth, forming an entire um, set of data for an entire grid of an area you want to test. And you'll measure within 5 or 10% how the magnetic field of the Earth varies in that area where you think there might be an anomaly. And it was used on the, the Ghost Hunter program years ago as well. I saw my meter right on television. It was kind of exciting. So I, I know it, it is effective in this area of anomalous magnetic field from the, from the Earth. But back to Tesla. Tesla essentially was uh, famous for, in my hometown of Buffalo, New York, um, developing the first transmission of electricity from uh, Niagara Falls to Buffalo, 25 miles uh, transmission back in 1896. And of course, he also developed in 1898 the application of Tesla coils for electrotherapy. And to me, this is very fascinating, and I ended up uh, investigating this so much so that um, Tesla had a handle on the application from his own experience. As we see here, there's a quote from Tesla saying that the high voltage electric currents are highly be beneficial uh, results in dealing with cancer. Uh, Dr. Kolscher was reporting this in 1932. And Tesla also conceived and understood that the body tissues behave like capacitors. Everyone know what capacitors are? They're parallel plates that store charge. The body's cells actually do that. And in fact, I'm happy to share with you that every cell membrane is like a capacitor. From the research that I've done, found out that every cell actually retains a voltage, a voltage gradient that's about 100,000 volts per centimeter or a million volts per meter. And this gradient is substantial. In other words, a million volts across a three-foot meter or so distance is, um, is sufficient to not only break down the air in some cases, depending on the dielectric constant, but in this uh, situation, we find that the body of a person can be subjected to these high voltage pressures, they called them pressures back then, and also be beneficial in charging up the cellular batteries. And that's the exciting part of uh, electrotherapy. And so 100 years later, we're rediscovering what Tesla already knew. In 1908, for example, 100 years ago, they had the Hercules machine, which was a Tesla coil, as you see across the top, and also uh, it was designed as a rotary spark gap with various noble gases that also enhance the effect. And the noble gas concept was also combined with high voltage therapies. Um, and this particular one with a handle is something that I actually was very fascinated by 
and decided to build a replica of it. That's also been called the violet ray, by the way. Uh, the violet ray is, is exempt from FDA uh, rules because it's grandfathered. It's, it's that old. And so I developed a Tesla coil in a suitcase, a very compact design. And the premiere, we'll probably have a premiere here tomorrow, uh, so you can actually try it. Put high voltage on your body and see how it relaxes pain, gets rid of joint issues. It's amazing the applications that you just discovered by trying it out. And then I worked on an electric chair, but we had to change the name a little bit. <laughs> I really liked the electric chair concept. I thought it was a great title, but it's already had a derogatory application. But um, this is fascinating to me, too, because Tesla also used the same concept and the same design as he lit a light bulb that you see on the cover of the um, Tesla, the master of lightning. And this is interesting, too, because this particular chair has a, a very um, high resistance pad that you sit on, and it essentially charges your entire body by contact with the Tesla coil output. And it was debuted at the Whole Person Healing Conference here in Washington, D.C. just a few years ago. And so my book is called Bioelectromagnetic Healing. It summarizes all these things I just talked about, including the information that electrons are antioxidants. This is the discovery I made, and then I found out that there's at least one other scientist that's also published on this topic. And it's fascinating to me to know that as we pop pills in the morning called vitamins, and we take vitamin A and vitamin C, uh, selenium, zinc, things that have antioxidant properties, all that's doing is donating electrons to stop the free radicals. Because the free radicals grab electrons from everything. And so free radicals have been associated with aging. So if you have more powerful antioxidants, it's been shown in television programs and the Science Channel have also demonstrated that we can probably retard aging just by having a high potency, like lipoic acid today is the strongest antioxidant you can buy, uh, CoQ10, for example. But to have an electrical device that would be, say, in your clothes or in a, an external device you'd use each day, you can pump electrons right into the body directly. And as I'm stating here, electrons are antioxidants, free radicals steal electrons, creating more free radical damage. And the 10,000 times is actually a quote from the organic textbook that I used in college. And I looked it up, went back to the book, looked up free radicals, and sure enough, as you take a shower in the morning, if you don't have a shower filter with an active charcoal filter, you're bathing yourself in chlorine. And chlorine disassociates at body temperature. And the chlorine atom is a very powerful uh, free radical, and it replicates causing 10,000 other free radicals in your body. So uh, I encourage everyone to consider having uh, shower filters and, of course, damaged uh, mitochondria DNA and so forth. So if you want to read more, the book's available. And moving on to the next connection is the permanent magnet motors. You're sort of getting an overview of four different presentations combined into one. Isn't this exciting? <laughs> and we go back to Giant Rock once again. <laughs> now, what happened at Giant Rock? Well, first of all, I found out about this in 1980 when I read a book called Sunburst Return of the Agents by Norman Paulson. And in that book was a picture of a UFO in daylight over Giant Rock, and then next to it was the policeman that took the picture. And what was interesting to me is that there was a generator associated with it that had something about um, uh, for self-perpetuating and magnets around the outer edge. By the way, that was a um, in picture of the UFO drawing as well. And you can see that in this uh, left-hand photo that it, it is kind of a uh, oval shaped across the top, maybe flat bottomed across the bottom. And then notice the plasma trail below it. And to me, this is very fascinating that the anti-gravity effect is probably associated with the field that is emanating from below the, um, below the ship. And as I say, the deputy sheriff who took the picture is also here uh, next to it. So this is a very, uh, very authentic. I was so moved by the book and the story, the, the land of Mu that was associated with the early origins of the Earth, that I thought, I've got to go out there and visit this and see this generator. So I did. I contacted the organization, stayed there three years, and then ended up building a homopolar generator for a master's degree in physics and convinced my uh, professor to let me do it for a, uh, for a project, master's degree project in physics. 
So to me, I thought, oh, I've got a free energy generator. And I kept uh, researching it and testing it, thinking that you know, the, there's great potential here. Um, but the interesting thing is that this is the actual wording from the original book. And then, of course, the later issues, the later editions of the book, he changed the title. He deleted this whole section. If you go on Amazon, for example, you have to get an old copy of the book to be able to read about this part of it. Twelve magnets around the outer edge. When I talked to Norman Paulson, he said it was a non-conducting disk. Well, that's not quite a homopolar, but it's sort of interesting that there's 12 magnets around there. And then two disks were involved to generate the gravity effect. Um, and so I kept that in mind. I've kept in mind ever since as far as where can we find this type of arrangement. Well, this one led me into the story of John Searle. In fact, this book is available at our exhibit booth, Anti-Gravity, The Dream Made Reality. Uh, we had John Thomas, the author, a couple of years ago, give um, a double session, an hour and a half presentation on, on John Searle. And John Searle is a living legend. Um, he has so much detail about how this works. There's uh, like 12 big books he's written. Actually, John Thomas has helped author them, uh, edit them for him. But the bottom line is this particular generator has 12 magnets around the outer edge. <clears throat> and they just happened, you're looking at drawings that were designed by Russians who actually replicated Searle's work around 1990, uh, 10 years after I got involved with the homopolar. And they were German. Um, this was a German presentation that Searle did. And then the Russians found out about it, decided to work on it. And as it turned out, I found out through the Department of Energy, a fellow I know there emailed me, and said, hey, these Russians are working on, on something you might be interested in. Sure enough, I recognized it. This is a Searle device they're making. And they were only doing the outer edge, the outer ring. <clears throat> and here's a kind of a, a simulation of how this machine's supposed to work. And to the left is uh, John Thomas giving his presentation at our conference on future energy in 2006. Um, we do have the DVDs available. And the fascinating part about the Searle disk, which is the unique type of generator, is that it, at low speeds, produces electricity. At higher speeds, it produces the anti-gravity effect. So all of a sudden, I've got a connection here. The, the, the two phenomena, energy and power, we all need them if we're traveling away from the Earth. This is the only device I've found that includes both. And so there's lots of people that have tried and failed in reproducing this. Um, there's lots of extra, as you see, details at the bottom here, uh, connecting it with transistor-type phenomenon. Um, I don't need to get into too much detail, but the, suffice it to say, the Russians have done a lot of work on it. And so what we did, I found, well, I can give myself a little bit of credit because my institute is dedicated to helping inventors that have such an unique inventions and also educating the public about them. So what I did was I found an investor, and the investor was interested enough to pay the Russians to come here to Washington, D.C., spend a week with Russian translators, we went to the Department of Energy as well, spent a day there with due diligence PhD people that, that grilled them and questioned them. And then uh, a year later, I ended up drafting a patent for them, um, basically drafting it so that then they could apply for their patent themselves. Um, and, and as you see, some of the details on the side is that 550 RPM was sort of the critical mode. It wants to accelerate in its, acceler in its RPMs once it gets up to around 600 RPM. And so they had lots of brakes. You can see at the bottom there's, there's various um, uh, baffling and, and brakes and various other uh, ways to keep it slowed down so they can just get electricity out of it. And they also had a strange type of phenomenon where the temperature seemed to drop in, in bands that were concentric around the machine. And the 7 degree C drop, 7 degree, uh, 13 degree F, was, was very substantial, so much so that it explained some of the energy output when you do the math. And here's a picture of us um, at the Department of Energy. And uh, the two Russians are, are in the middle. And um, I'm over there. And basically, that's the historic picture of when we first started to do our due diligence on this uh, invention. And since then, there's been a lot of work that's been done. Here's one, the only photo I'm allowed to show the public of how the progress has been going since then. And 2004 is when this was taken. And the interesting thing is they tried to upgrade the magnets. 
They decided to get stronger, and they figured, oh, we'll improve it this time when we build it. Well, unfortunately, that wasn't the correct design. So they've had to replace the magnets to go back to the uh, standard type of ferrite magnets that were originally uh, in, the, in the original design that worked. And, and the interesting thing is these are calibrated um, uh, springs and, and shock absorbers on the right side, on, on three sides, that, that can be used to measure the force if there's any force that's being developed. And since uh, Dr. Ed Mitchell's here today, I thought I'd throw in this slide as well. Here he is um, with his uh, money in his pocket looking at a homopolar generator back in 1980. And this was when I actually became involved uh, briefly with Bruce De Palma and his work on the homopolar because that's how the generator got built at the Sunburst uh, community. Uh, it's called the Sunburst Machine, and Bruce De Palma built it for them. Um, and notice on this cover of the magazine, we, we see the Searle disk in the middle and the homopolar to the right. Um, at that time, when this was published, um, 1994, it wasn't really known that the connection is there between the homopolar and the serial disk. But nowadays, especially after the patent came out, um, it's, it's an acceptable, uh, interesting um, connection. And I think there's a misprint here. Yeah, this should be 1994, not 1998. Um, and so going from magnetism, I do need to share with you the fact that magnetism is a very unusual phenomenon. It's designed and powered by spinning electrons. And the spinning electrons really get their energy from the quantum vacuum. So we really have a source of free energy just sitting there in every magnet, but we're not looking at the magnetic radiance. So I decided to pursue the spiral magnetic motor because here you actually have a, a gradient, in other words, a changing magnetic field as you go around the uh, cycle. As you can see, the stator is very close at the top, and then it gets wider and wider uh, as you go uh, clockwise around. And this was published in Popular Science in 1979, and this is the, probably the only uh, machine that works powered by a permanent magnet motor radiant. Now, unfortunately, the Japanese who worked on it, the Kuroteiko um, company, decided to put an electromagnet up in the le left-hand corner there, and this basically destroyed the free energy concept um, so that it could be self-powered. And instead, we're looking at some other improvements on it that basically are, are, are looking very promising these days. But if you wanted to test it for yourself, you can get a copy on, say, Google slash patents of this patent from Hartman. It's 4215330. And what's great about this is, and this slide sort of summarizes my um, arguments about the magnetic gradient, is that you can take and buy very inexpensively a whole bunch of small cylindrical magnets or bar magnets, as you can see in the top view uh, picture, put them together in this arrangement exactly as the patent shows you. Blow up the patent diagram big enough so you can put them right where they belong, and you'll see it propels a ball bearing. Not only propels a ball bearing horizontally, but the ball bearing will climb a 10 degree incline. And of course, the patent even shows you how you connect these in series, and of course, have something, I don't dare say it, perpetual motion. No, I didn't say that. But this is exactly the point, that once you decide these and discover the source of the energy, perpetual motion is explained away. And I found it again and again in physics journals that they, they give, um, what would you say, verbal recognition, and they always put the Latin in there, perpetuum mobile, so it looks a little more scientific, you know. <laughs> and, and they'll even put the one sentence that, that it may look like it, there could possibly be a connection, and then they discount it immediately by the scientific explanation. So it's, it's interesting how the science is advancing, because to me, this is our destiny. We cannot keep burning fuel. We, we are really at our end of, of that cycle, and the Humbert's curve proves it. So we have to get into a cleaner fuel source. And all the inventions that we keep coming across prove that this is really our destiny. And here you see some of the ideas over in the Lower right-hand corner is my particular discovery. I've talked to the author who's published this in IEEE Transactions on Magnets. And this is a fascinating way to produce a pulsed magnetic field without coil. And it's um, piezoelectric and um, giant uh, magnetostrictive device. So I have great hope for that. And we should hopefully be seeing permanent magnet motored cars. In other words, a 
magnetic car instead of an electric car. And that's my design for the future. In fact, I've even talked to the flywheel people. Bitterly Flywheels, for example, is willing to design the magnets into the flywheel so that we'll have uh, the combination working and the flywheel storing the energy. <clears throat> now, the third project that I got involved with as well, and I have to give credit to Maury King for um, pushing me into this area, is the uh, quantum vacuum and zero-point energy. We find lots of connections to various areas in the uh, literature that, that people love zero-point energy. I mean, you've probably heard, how many people have heard zero-point energy before I've even mentioned it? Great, this is wonderful. You're a good crowd. <laughs> and, and then the fact is, you've probably heard lots of exaggerated things about it. However, the scientific stuff is equally as impressive. In fact, the scientific stuff is more impressive, so much so that you tend to disbelieve the actual science. Um, and of course, NASA's done a lot of work on it as well. Uh, it's associated with the Casimir effect. Here's a NASA website uh, page that describes 10 to the 24th or 10 to the 58th joules per meter cubed, which is amazing density. It has more energy density in a cubic centimeter of vacuum than there is in nuclear reactors of the same volume. That's the fascinating part about it. And yet no one's figured out how to tap this energy, you know? And that's where I come in. So what I've designed in the book is a lot of different scenarios and discovered inventors already pursuing them. But one of the fascinating areas that I think is the simplest, easiest, and of course, solid state, is the rectifying of thermal and non-thermal electric noise. Zero-point energy causes noise in circuits. In fact, when you're looking or hearing a hissing sound on your radio or television, you're looking at the quantum vacuum. And you're looking at the background um, Big Bang noise as well. But the interesting thing is, any noise can be rectified. And that's where diodes come in. And there's lots of diodes I've come across that have zero bias. So, and of course, here's a couple of molecular diodes. It shows how small you can make it. Now, one of our speakers at, in the 2006 conference on future energy was Dr. Pino, Fabrizio Pino, who used to work for Jet Propulsion Lab. And he spent years there and then decided to form his own company. And it's an interstellar uh, technology company in uh, California. And here's his engine. It uses a Casimir force, but see, when you get down to the quantum vacuum state, you can actually do a lot of tricks. And so in my, one of my books, I have a whole list of toolkit tricks that a quantum vacuum engineer could actually play with. And one of the tools here he has, where you see RS on, and those of you over there, you see in the middle RS on, those are little micro lasers. And when he turns on a micro laser, he totally changes the Casimir force within the cavity. It costs him almost no energy to turn that little laser on, but the Casimir force has a big effect on the whole cavity, pushing electrons. And that's exactly how he's designed it. It's a tiny thing, as you can see, 50 to 100, this is a MEMS device, if you know what MEMS is. Um, and it's working on the micron scale. And of course, you can gang these up so you can get kilowatts and megawatts just by reproducing them, much like we do right now in, in flat screen TVs. You've got a whole bunch of diodes in an array, and you're looking at the cumulative effect of all of them. Well, I decided to do this uh, when the, after getting fired from the patent office, I, I decided to finish my PhD. And, I, and interesting enough, and this is a good crowd to tell the story, in 1999, I tried to have my first conference on free energy at the State Department. Do you think I got in trouble for doing that? It worked real good for about a year until the only physicist in the State Department says, oh, we got to have a peer review of your papers. And I had 14 uh, two-day conference, 14 speakers all lined up. And of course, he didn't want to do a peer review. He just wanted to kick me out of the State Department. And the American Physical Society, which I stopped my membership in, decided to attack me in weekly columns. And it's called What's New, Robert Park. And of course, the Patent Office people read the Robert Park columns and decided, oh, we got to get involved in, in stopping this. Well, as I inquired on moving out of there to the DOE, the DOE said, no, we don't want you. You're too controversial now. Uh, the place I worked, the Department of Commerce, also became a hotbed of trouble when I even investigated using the auditorium there. So suffice it to say, I turned a, a bad thing into a good result and, and did actually investigate zero-point energy for a feasibility study for my PhD. And, um, and then I got reinstated six years later, which I'm happy to 
say I actually got through that day. And recently now, but since that was a very technical book, I decided to do a very um, watered-down layman's book with lots of pictures and also lots of easy explanations and almost no, no equations at all. And that's Zero Point Energy Fuel of the Future, um, which is available also at the exhibit booth. And so the interesting thing is you see this in the New York Times, you see it in lots of different magazines, and many UFO uh, articles always point to the fact that, yeah, this, these saucers that fly interstellar must be using zero-point energy for their power source. Um, and, and this is something that we sort of take for granted, but we don't understand how this could be possible. And so I think there's great hope in the future, and especially now as we get to the last topic, propulsion, I think you'll see that there are a lot of uh, ideas here that are worth pursuing. Now, first of all, when you hear on the Science Channel and other programs about the SETI program and various other scientists that are doing what they call planet hunting, uh, have you ever heard these PhDs say, well, we don't really know where to look, which stars to target to see if there's planets around them? Well, did they ever think of looking at the Betty and Barney Hill story? And the star map? Nope, guess not. And interestingly enough, as you look at the Zeta Reticuli incident, we have a few reprints from Astronomy Magazine. This star map is the most fascinating star map made, even by astronomers, of our local neighborhood, up to 50 light years from Earth. And 50 light years is not that far. When you consider 100,000 light years is the size of our galaxy, 50 light years is really the, the range in which we're exposed to. And it took years later for Marjorie Fish to put together a 3D bead and string replication of the star map. And, and I have to correct that because she did a 50 uh, light year local neighborhood uh, mapping of all the stars and then started to look for the star map to see if there's any correlation. And as it turned out, this star map verified that all the stars in this drawing our solar mass size, the size of our sun, which is very unusual. Our sun is, is, uh, is in a minority if you look in the galaxy. They're usually giants, they're usually binaries, there are all kinds of stuff you can learn in astronomy that are really exemptions to finding a place like ours. And so solar mass size is small, compact, and within a short distance we have this critical zone where the Earth is that supports life. And that's what the astronomers know, but they don't know how to find the, these stars. Well, all these stars are solar mass size. And they're the only ones in the 50 light year distance. So you got to give Betty Hill a great deal of credit. And of course, she didn't even know that she had recorded this in her mind until she was hypnotized, which adds a lot of authenticity to it as well. So that's the kind of technicalities that I look for. Even Wendell Stevens, for example, you probably know Wendell Stevens and all the books he's written. Well, he's done audio recordings, he's done technical analysis, spectral analysis. That's how you finally get down to how the machines are working on the ships. And many of them, of course, since they're rotary, probably are rotary turning and spinning engines. But to me, this is a very valuable piece of evidence. And I look forward to actually sending this, and I have sent this to astronomers to at least invite them to kind of get interdisciplinary. There's no reason they have to stay in their telescope thinking that they have to guess at where to point it. Um, they can actually take some uh, suggestions from the other, other side, so to speak. And of course, when we talk about propulsion, there's lots of historical anti-gravity research. And this is the interesting thing as well, that in the physics journals, such as 1962, we see specific ways to create uh, an anti or opposing upward gravitational field. And to me, this is very interesting. Many of them, of course, require a lot of energy, and that can also be a little bit um, uh, prohibitive. <clears throat> but I luckily was involved in um, helping Nick Cook when he wrote The Hunt for Zero Point and the uh, attempt to identify and describe the classified uh, world of anti-gravity technology. And he visited lots of places and people, and for example, the president of Lockheed, and, and he did a videotape as well about this afterwards. I don't know if you saw The Billion Dollar Secret. It was a two-hour special. Um, it was on the Discovery Channel. And of course, he's sitting in front of the, the, the president of Lockheed, and he's asking him, 
well, what are white projects? Oh, white projects are things that we can work on and we can talk about and we can describe to them. And, uh, and then there were some other projects as well. And he says, what are black projects? And he says, well, black projects are the kind that we cannot talk about. And then he shut up. <laughs> you know, and Nick Cook asked another question about black projects, and there was no answer. <laughs> so um, that's about as far as you get with the, um, the direct route. But the indirect route is a good way to do it as well, and that is accumulate the evidence, spend years recording anecdotes like Paul Hill did, and then get somebody like um, Robert Wood to put together the book and get it published years later after you pass away. And then we have an historic re record of the behavior of UFOs and the fact that they obey physics laws. The inertia, um, the, for example, the right-hand turns. I'm fascinated by the fact that UFOs do right-hand turns. And even some classified uh, projects apparently do it as well. Uh, craft do it. And what I call them are inertia-free turns, and you'll see why in a second. But the interesting thing is, Paul Hill does a great analysis. If you have the ability to create the force, like a 10G reversal, um, you basically can see it happening in less than a second. So, so a person sitting on Earth looking at this UFO make a very quick turn, he might think that it's violating the laws of physics. But Paul Hill proves in this book, and I highly recommend it, for people investigating any science behind UFOs uh, to find that you can actually explain, as he does comparing by airplane acceleration and saucer acceleration, the same principles apply. And the banking effect on this diagram here is true. Saucers will bank when they turn, just like airplanes do, because the force is being projected out of the bottom. So this is the future. For example, here's a good video to show you what I'm talking about. Now watch this saucer very closely as we turn out. Get ready. Everybody see that? I love it. <laughs> and see, that type of acceleration is really something that um, I think is our future, too, because the field propulsion also involves the separation of the, what's causing the inertia. And I'll explain that in a second. So here's some examples of UFOs that have at least had some scientific explanations behind them that a physicist could actually look at and then try to make some sense out of it. Uh, the electrokinetics of Townsend Brown, uh, John Searle's electrogravitics, and of course the secondary gravitational effects like the Lazar saucer. Um, he's given a couple lectures that are on videotape explaining how the nuclear strong force can actually be connected to gravity. And it does make sense. There is some physics there that's worth pursuing. Um, the Adamski UFO, Andreasen UFO. And so the interesting thing is, we oftentimes in audiences, especially, for example, the National Space Society, when I give a similar lecture, I tone it down as far as the mention of UFOs, of course, but I at least include this slide and some of the others because here's research that is now, to me, very scientifically valid in associating subsonic flight and superluminal flight. And we find the form of the equations are identical, and also the behavior of the curves are exponential as you approach the barrier, the velocity barrier. And of course, the bottom graphs show the same thing, that as we look at the speed of sound and the speed of light, you tend to get, get a compression effect in the medium. And of course, in, in air, you're getting a compression of air. But what kind of medium is being compressed as you're flying through space? Well, it's the quantum vacuum. Quantum vacuum literally exhibits a, a compression as well. And it's called einstein hopf drag. So there's interesting um, viscous drag being compared to the Lorentz force that's exerted by the zero-point field. And this is a close-up of the two graphs showing the flight resistance increase with speed. And so David Froning, who shared these graphs with me, and I, <clears throat> and I saw them, him in uh, Utah at a local chapter meeting of the National Space Society, is pursuing this very seriously in uh, terms of uh, the uh, simulations, the mathematical analysis, and he hopes to actually see a working model of this uh, soon. 
And so the, <clears throat> the interesting thing is that the superluminal saucer, as we call it, is being evolved in design as a saucer design. He's, he's, he's forced to conclude, and this I find very exciting, from basic principles, he comes up with a saucer design because he wants to include a toroid. And a toroid is circular. So all of a sudden we have a discovery that saucers now have scientific reasoning. In other words, there's something inside them that obeys our physics laws and it's understandable. And the toroid is exactly how he's perturbing the quantum vacuum electromagnetic field. The two are connected. And you can see the uh, field lines that he's creating with the toroid at the bottom. 